Welcome back, BioMonsters. Today we're going to be talking about DNA replication. Now, we are going to do a review about DNA, but before we do, let's go ahead and talk about this word replication for just one second. The term replication or to replicate means to make or to copy. So the process of DNA replication is just simply how we copy or how we make more DNA. So essentially what we want to be able to do is take a DNA molecule that looks like this, and we know that this is DNA because it has that classic double helix structure, and we want to take that DNA molecule and turn it into two new DNA molecules that are exactly like the original strand that it came from. So our job today is to figure out how do we go from our parent, or we can also call it our original DNA, to our two identical daughter molecules. So by the end of today's lecture, you should be able to tell us how we go from this to this and what all the steps are in between. So let's go ahead and dive in. But before we actually start talking about DNA replication specifically, let's do a quick review. Now, DNA is actually an abbreviation, and I hope that you remember from our last discussion what the D actually stands for. The D stands for the type of sugar that's found in DNA, and the type of sugar is called deoxyribose. So the D stands for deoxyribose. The NA stands for the type of macromolecule that DNA actually is. So DNA is a macromolecule, and we talked about four different types, the major uh, classes, uh, at the very beginning of the year. And the type of macromolecule that DNA is is something called a nucleic acid. So if we were to put these two things together, we should be able to figure out that DNA actually stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And you need to make sure that you know this term because you're going to see it again on a quiz and also on a test. All right, so now that we know what DNA stands for, deoxyribonucleic acid, let's go ahead and talk about what DNA actually looks like. Now from the intro, you'll remember that DNA has this very interesting structure. It's kind of hard to miss. It is double-stranded. So that means we DNA basically has two sides or two strands. And when those two strands are held together, and they're held together by hydrogen bonds, they develop this unique shape. And this unique shape is called a double helix. And that double helix is also sometimes referred to as a twisted ladder because it looks like a ladder that's been twisted. Um, and then it's also sometimes called a spiral staircase. So all of those terms work when we're describing the overall structure of DNA. Now, in order to make this really large structure, we also need to focus on the building blocks or the monomers. And if you remember, mono, mono the prefix means one, and this term monomer actually means small, or we could say building block. So we want to know what the building blocks of DNA actually are that allow us to have that unique double helix shape. Well, the first thing that we're going to have to do is go back and think about um, what the actual macromolecule is because we have a mnemonic device to help us remember. Well, if I go back up here, I know that DNA is a nucleic acid, and nucleic acid stands or begins with the letter N. And our memory clue was N to N. So that means that our monomer also has to start with an N, and in fact it does. So nucleic acids are made up of individual monomers called nucleotides. And just to make sure that nobody's confused, a nucleotide always has a phosphate, a 5-carbon sugar, and everybody should know that that sugar is our deoxyribose that we talked about before, and then it also has a nitrogen base coming off of it. So a nucleotide actually has three different parts. Well, we're going to focus on this part right here to answer this next question. Well, what are the bases that are actually found in DNA? There are four. So we have four bases, and the four bases are adenine, and adenine is abbreviated with the letter A. Then we have thymine, and thymine is abbreviated with the letter T. And then next we have guanine. 
And guanine, as I bet you can already imagine, is abbreviated with a G. And then lastly, we have our cytosine. And cytosine is abbreviated with a C. Now the last thing that we need to do before we can actually talk about DNA replication is to talk about the base pairing rule. And the base pairing rule is pretty simple. All it says is that this letter always pairs up with this letter, or this base always pairs up with this base when we're talking about DNA. And the base pairing is pretty simple. A will only ever pair with T in DNA, and G will only ever pair with C. Now we do have a mnemonic device to help us remember that, and the way that we're going to remember our A and T pairing is to say apple trees, and to remember that it's the first letter of each one of those that tells us what the base pairing rule actually is. And then for our next one, our mnemonic device for G and C, we're going to say go carts. And to remember that, we're going to go ahead and highlight the first letter of each term to remember that G goes to C. All right, now that we've covered all the basics, let's go ahead and answer this really important question. I would put a big star next to this. This is really important. Not only is it important for you to understand how DNA replication happens, we also need you to understand why. Why do we have to copy DNA? Well, in order to answer this question, you're going to have to think back to our discussion on mitosis. And so let's quickly talk about what mitosis is. Mitosis is the division of a cell, right? So division of a cell specifically of the cell's nucleus. And remember, mitosis has to happen for three reasons. And the three reasons why mitosis happens actually answers this question, why we need to copy DNA. The first thing that we need mitosis for is something called growth. We have to be able to make more cells so that organisms can get bigger. But in order to make more cells, we have to make sure that it has the right DNA, and not only the right stuff, but also the right amount. So we have to copy the DNA before the cell divides in order to allow growth for the individual. The next reason why we need mitosis is for repair. Now you guys know that cells get damaged all the time, paper cuts. Uh, uh, bruises, anytime that you eat and food goes through the digestive system. If you've ever had a, a pizza burn in your mouth, those are damaged cells. They all have to be replaced. But again, just like with growth, we need to make sure before we actually repair those damaged cells that the cells that we're repairing them from actually have enough DNA to be divided to make new copies of the cell. And then lastly, it's not something that happens inside of our species, but we also need to be able to copy DNA to allow for asexual reproduction. So before a bacterial cell, so if this is my bacterial cell, let's say here it is, and we'll say that this is my E. coli. If my E. coli wants to make a copy of itself, before it can do that, because we want it to be an identical copy, it actually has to copy its DNA so that these two things can be clones of the original, because we want them to be identical copies. Now, the next question that you need to ask yourself is, um, what happens if we don't copy our DNA? Well, that's a really important thing to understand. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a cell, and I'm going to say that this represents a normal human somatic cell. So I'm going to go ahead and write that. So this represents my somatic cell, and I hope that you remember that somatic means body cell, so cells found in the heart, the eyeballs, the skin, the stomach, the intestines, anything that doesn't have to do with sexual reproduction. In order for this cell to then divide and make two identical copies, we actually have to copy the DNA before this cell actually goes into the process of mitosis. Well, what would happen if we didn't copy the DNA? If we didn't copy the DNA, instead of making an identical cell, what we would end up with is a cell that only has half the DNA that it actually needs. So only half the DNA would be found in these two cells. And that's a problem because we know that in order to be healthy and genetically normal, we need those cells to be exactly like the parent cell. So this would be a really bad thing. It can lead to um, genetic disorders. And in most cases, when we're dropping our number down by that, by that much, we're actually going to cause a number of other problems and the individual would not be able to live. So instead of seeing this event, what we actually want to see is we want to start with 46 our normal somatic cell number, and we want to do the process of mitosis. But before mitosis actually happens, we're going to do DNA 
replication, which is what we're going to be talking about today, copying the DNA. And when we copy the DNA, DNA, that ensures that our new cells will still have 46 chromosomes or the correct amount of DNA. And if this is the case, this individual will be healthy and happy. So that's what we want to see. So now that we've talked about the basic understanding or the basic, basic rationale for DNA replication, we're going to go ahead and talk about some intimate details. But before we talk about some intimate details, let's go ahead and just talk about the process in general to help prepare our brains for this new information. So copying DNA, it's a process called DNA replication, which we've already talked about. It's the title of, of our discussion today. And the next thing that we need to figure out is where does DNA replication take place? Well, let's go ahead and think back to our original DNA molecule. So here's our original DNA molecule. And we know that this is DNA. I hope that you guys would know this because it's a double-stranded molecule. And this double-stranded molecule is very large. So I'm going to go ahead and write that. This is a very large molecule. So wherever we find it in the cell, that's where it's stuck. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a picture of a cell. And inside that cell, I'm going to draw another circle. And this circle represents a nuclear envelope, so it is the nucleus. Now inside my nucleus, I'm going to find this DNA molecule that I just drew. So here's my double-stranded molecule. This double-stranded molecule, even though it might want to try to leave, it can't leave because it's too fat. It can't leave the um, nuclear envelope to get out to the rest of the cell. And so because it can't leave, anything that requires DNA for anything is always going to have to require its use in the location where it's found. So when I ask you, where does DNA replication actually take place, you guys should be saying to yourself, well, DNA replication takes place where we find our DNA. And DNA can only be found in one location. That one location is the nucleus. So we should be able to answer this question now, where does DNA replication take place? Only in the nucleus. And if I were to ask you why, hint, hint, on a quiz or a test, you should be able to tell me because DNA is too large. It can never leave where it's found, and it's only found in the nucleus of the cell. All right, we've come to our first stop and jot. Go ahead and pause the video and answer the questions on your day sheet. When you think you have the right answer, call your teacher over to check it for correctness. All right, now that we've talked about a brief overview of DNA replication, where it takes place and why we need it to happen, and we've also talked about some basics about the overall structure of DNA, let's talk about the steps of DNA replication. DNA replication happens in just four steps, so you only need to know these four. The first step is we have to start with, a, with our parent molecule of DNA, and this parent molecule is referred to also as the original. So our original DNA molecule. The next thing that we have to do is we have to unzip that DNA strand. Remember, our DNA looks like this. It's a double helix. Well, unfortunately, as long as it's in this shape, we can't do anything with it. We actually have to separate it. So we have to separate it in step two. Then in step three, once we separate the two strands from one another, we actually have to figure out what's going to go on that open side. So we're going to complementary base pair. And when we talk about complementary base pairing, we're just talking about our base pairing rule. A always goes to T. C or G are always paired together as well. And then the last step is proofreading. It's also the last step of writing a really good paper. Remember, your sequence of DNA is really important. My sequence makes me unique. Your sequence makes you unique. And it ensures that you're not a lobster because a lobster has its own unique genetic sequence. So we want to make sure that we proofread because if any of our letters are paired up incorrectly, it can cause huge problems for the organism. And we don't want that to happen. So now that we've talked about the four steps, let's go ahead and dive in and talk about step one. Now for step one, remember we're starting with our parent strand, so we're going to have a original, or we can say parent, molecule of DNA is going to be the original to be copied. So let's go ahead and fill in our picture. So here's our picture here. This picture represents our parent DNA, or we could also say it's the original DNA 
that's going to be what we want to copy. And remember, the end result is to end up taking this DNA molecule and turning it into two new DNA molecules that are identical to this original strand. So we're going to figure out how to do that as we look beyond step number one. Now, in step number two, we actually have to unzip our DNA molecule, but we need an enzyme in order to do that. Let's go ahead and highlight this word enzyme. We haven't talked about this term in a long time, but enzymes are really important. The reason why they're really important is because they only have one job. Enzymes speed up chemical reactions. And I hope that you remember that from quarter number one. So enzymes speed up chemical reactions, and as you can imagine, DNA replication is a chemical reaction. It's a multi-step chemical reaction. So we're going to need an enzyme in order to jumpstart this process. And the enzyme that we're going to need in order to make this process happen is an enzyme called helicase. And if you'll notice, it ends in ASE, and I hope that you remember that most enzymes are going to end in ASE or ACE. So an enzyme called helicase comes into unzip and separate the two strands of parent DNA. And the reason why we call it helicase, A-S-E, is because it unzips the helix. So it sounds like what it's actually breaking apart. So in our picture, our helicase would actually look something like this. So this is my helicase. And this helicase would be moving in this direction. And as it does, it's going to be separating the DNA strands, the two sides, from one another. It's kind of like if you have a coat on. As long as your zipper is zipped up to the top, you can never get your coat off. You couldn't change the shape or open it up. Same thing is true with DNA. So you kind of have to unzip the DNA molecule in order to open it up so we can read the letters that are found on the nucleotides. All right, we've come to our next stop and jot. Go ahead and pause the video, and when you think you have the right answer to the questions on your day sheet, call your teacher over to check it for correctness. All right, we finally made it to step three. Now in step three, each strand can be used as a template to make a new strand, and our template is our original. If the single strand has an adenine on it, it would pair up with a thymine, and that's our base pairing rule that we talked about before, A pairs to T. However, if our original or a template strand has a guanine or a G, it would always pair up with a cytosine, and remember, cytosine is always represented by our C. So again, we're talking about our base pairing rule, apple trees, A to T, and go-karts, G to C. Now, in order to actually do this base pairing, we need to talk about another enzyme. So the enzyme that's going to join these new bases together is something called DNA, which makes sense because we're dealing with DNA, uh, DNA polymerase. And again, we see this ASE, so we know it's an enzyme. And I hope that you remember that that prefix poly means many. So DNA polymerase brings in... many nucleotides. So let's go ahead and look at our picture and see if we can figure out what's going on. So this dark blue strand here is my template, or we can call it our original. And I also have another one over here. And remember, these two came from our original DNA molecule. So this is our template or our original. And the light blue that you see, this friend right here, represents a nucleotide. And that nucleotide is going to be paired up correctly, A to T, C to G, T to A, A to T, G to C, with the enzyme DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is bringing in these nucleotides and basically base pairing. Like we talked about in our last lecture, we said that if we know what one half of DNA looks like, we always know what the other half is going to look like, and that's the key to DNA replication. So if you can imagine this process completing, you'll notice that our new DNA molecule will have one old side, but also develop one new side because DNA polymerase is coming in and base pairing off of our template strand. All right, we've come to our next stop and jot. Go ahead and pause the video, and when you think you have the right answer to the questions on your day sheet, call your teacher over to check it for correctness. All right, we finally made it to the last step. 
Now in our last step, we're going to be using an enzyme as well, but we're going to be using the same enzyme in step four that we used in step three. So DNA polymerase, which you'll remember in step three was responsible for base pairing, also has another job in step four. It actually checks and fixes any mistakes that it finds, which means that it proofreads our DNA for us. Now, once we have that proofreading happening, we now have two new strands. And that's really important because that's the whole point of doing DNA replication. But what's unique about our new strands that we make is what we're going to be talking about next. So I'm going to go ahead and put a big star here because this is really important. Each is going to be identical to the parent strand, but with one old strand and one new each. So let's go ahead and see what we actually mean by that. So we need to see whether or not our DNA replication actually worked. So this was our original DNA, or we can also call it our parent DNA molecule. So we're looking at our parent DNA molecule. We want to go from this to two new identical DNA molecules to the original. So we want to double check and make sure that it actually worked. Well, if I'm looking here, you'll notice that I have um, one old strand. Here's my other old strand. And if we wanted to go back and ask ourselves, where did that old strand come from? This strand came from my parent DNA. This strand also came from my parent DNA when helicase unzipped the molecule. You'll also notice that on the opposite side, we have a new strand. And then we also have a new strand here. What we want to do now is make sure that this strand looks exactly like our, or this molecule DNA looks exactly like our original. So if I go through and I check the base pairs, yes, I know that this was done correctly. So I'm going to put a check mark here. And if I go back and I look at my original here, I notice that this one was also done correctly. So these two new molecules of DNA are exactly like the original with one exception. The one exception is, is that it has one old strand and it has one new strand. Now that's really important because DNA, every new DNA molecule that's made has one old, so we've conserved half of the original molecule and one new, we say that this process is semi-conservative. If it was completely conservative, it would have only the old stuff in it. But we say that it's semi because it's half. We conserve half of the original molecule with our old strand that we use as our template and we go ahead and build our new strand using our DNA polymerase. All right, so now that we've talked about that, let's go ahead and draw it out to make sure that we truly understand the process of DNA replication. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my original DNA molecule. Here it is. We, let's go ahead and draw our double helix in to make sure that it represents our DNA well. So this is my, again, my original DNA. Also, if you guys remember, it's also called the parent DNA. I want to take this guy and I want to start the process of DNA replication, but I can't do it unless I do something first. I actually have to unzip my DNA. So the first thing that I want to do, so here's my original, so this is step number one. The next thing that I want to do is unzip the DNA. Once I unzip the DNA, I'll have this strand here, and I'll have this strand here. And if you'll remember, each strand will have a sequence uh, found along that backbone. So let's say that this is A, C, C, T, and this would have to be the complementary base pair, which would be T, G, G, A. And the enzyme that came in to actually separate these two strands from one another is a special enzyme that only has one job, and its one job is to move through DNA and unzip it, and this enzyme is called helicase. So this is going to represent now step two. So step two, we've, we've taken our DNA molecule, we've opened it up, and we've unzipped it with our helicase. The next thing that we need to do then is use our DNA polymerase because we have to do something called base pair. So in order to base pair, we're going to use a special enzyme. So here's my old DNA, here's my old DNA, and by old we mean our template. 
So I'm going to go ahead and write that. That's my template strand. Here's also my template strand. I'm going to go ahead and fill in my letters on my template strand, just like my uh, original picture. Now once I do that, I'm going to take a special enzyme called DNA polymerase. So here are my two DNA polymerases. DNA polymerase is going to go through and as it does, it's going to base pair. So this is my DNA polymerase. Here's my DNA polymerase. Now DNA polymerase, all it does is pair up A's to T's and C's to G's. That's its only job. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in my new strand. So my new strand is going to go on this side and we're just going to base pair because that's what DNA polymerase does. And I hope that you guys can go ahead and base pair just like I did. And remember this new strand that I've created, this is my, these are my new strands. I now have this process. And if I look at my completed DNA molecule, my completed DNA molecule is going to look like this. So I'm going to have a DNA molecule that's half of the original and half of the new. And I'm going to go ahead and make sure I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I have my nitrogen bases where they need to be. And before we go from here to here, there's one last thing that we want to make sure that we know we did before we actually are done with the process. We proofread and we proofread still using our DNA polymerase. So we're going to make sure that all of our letters are paired up correctly. And we know that we did it correctly because if we compare these two new DNA molecules to my original, they're going to be exactly the same. But there is a special term to describe this because we have one template or old strand and one new strand. So we call this process semi-conservative. So that's DNA replication in a nutshell. You need to make sure, let's go ahead and highlight our important things. You need to know your helicase enzyme unzips your DNA molecule. Your DNA polymerases do two things. They base pair and they also proofread in order to allow us to come up with two new um, identical DNA molecules that are exactly like our parent DNA or the original DNA that they came from. All right, we've made it to our next stop and drop. Go ahead and pause the video and answer the questions on your day sheet. When you think you have the right answer, call your teacher over to check it for correctness. The last thing that we need to talk about is the importance of proofreading. And at this point, you guys should know the mechanism for, for proofreading is the um, enzyme called DNA polymerase. So let's go ahead and write that so that we don't get confused. We know DNA polymerase is responsible for proofreading when we talk about DNA replication. Well, unfortunately, sometimes DNA polymerase makes mistakes. And when it makes mistakes, it makes one of three types. So there are a total of three types of mutations or DNA mistakes when we're talking about DNA uh, replication that you need to know. So let's go ahead and give you an example. So I'm going to go ahead and write down a sequence of DNA. And you can go ahead and write it on your notes. In a deletion event, what will happen is we'll just take any letter, and let's say that we'll take the G, and we'll eliminate it. So we delete a letter. When we delete a letter, we'll end up with a new sequence, and that new sequence now reads A, A, G, T, T, C. And the problem here you'll notice is that this sequence is actually too short. So this will not be read correctly, and it can lead to problems uh, inside the organism. Another type of uh, proofreading mistake that can happen is something called insertion. So insertion, we're going to start with our original sequence, A, A, G, G, T, T, C. And in this process, what we're actually going to do is we're going to take a new letter and we're going to actually put it in there. So we're going to insert an extra letter. And in this case, let's say that the extra letter that we're inserting is an A. And if we insert an A here, our new sequence is now going to look like this. A, A, G, G, we're going to put our A in, T, T, C. 
Now in this case, you'll notice that our sequence is actually too long. So again, we don't have the right sequence and you know that the sequence determines what, our, what proteins are gonna be made. And so this is also a bad thing to actually happen. The last type of proofreading error that can happen is something called a substitution. So let's go ahead and write down our same sequence, A, A, G, G, T, T, C. In a substitution event, all we're going to do is swap out a letter. So we're going to swap out a letter. So let's say that the letter we're going to swap out is this A. We're going to take this A and we're going to replace it. We're going to replace it with a, mm, let's replace it with a T. Now if we do that, our new sequence is now going to look like this, a T, G, G, T, T, C. The problem with this here is not that it's too long, like an insertion, or that our sequence is too short, like in deletion. The problem with the substitution event is that if I put a T here instead of an A, this now, that letter swap changes the entire way that this sequence of DNA is going to be read. Now, all of these um, mutations or proofreading errors, a deletion, insertion, or substitution, all have major problems. And the major problems that they can cause are cancers, just swapping out a letter, adding an extra letter, or removing a letter can cause your DNA to actually tell cells to start dividing uncontrollably, which is what cancer is, or it can cause other types of genetic diseases or disorders. And the list can go on and on and on and on. Cystic fibrosis, PKU, uh, the list is innumerable because there are lots of different types of genetic disorders that can affect human beings and other types of living things on the planet. All right, we've come to our last stop and jot. Go ahead and pause the video, answer the questions on your day sheet. When you think that you have the right answer, call your teacher over to check it for correctness. Thanks so much, guys, and good luck studying.